Welcome, everybody, to another episode of Cold Emails, Hot Takes. Keith, it's great to have you on the podcast. Thanks for having me, man. Yeah, Keith is the creator of I Stay Ready. He's a master at cold email and blitz scaling companies with cold outreach. And it's funny because Keith was actually one of our first, let's say, enterprise whale clients when we started instantly. And that was exactly one year ago when we launched. It feels like a lifetime. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, and, you're right. Yeah. And and him and his team got like 50 or more accounts right away and started scaling right away, getting thousands of positive replies of cold emailing. So Keith knows a thing or two about how to scale. And maybe Keith, for the viewers listening, can you tell us a little bit more about what you do? Yeah. So um, what, what I do is I actually work with just lots of entrepreneurs in a lot of different industries. Uh, I've been fortunate. I've had the opportunity to probably work in about 20 different niches, anywhere from I'm a physical therapist by trade. Uh, I've done e-com, shipping, logistics, lead gen, uh, sales generation to sales training to just pretty much everything across the board. And one of the fun things about it is I've had a chance to work with so many companies. You learn a lot along the way. And um, as part of it, that's why I created I Stay Ready. as because the joke I say is if I stay ready, I don't have to get ready. And for any entrepreneur, it's, they always think it's like one thing is going to fix it all. And it's just not true. And we want to believe that. It's like, just, oh, if I just do this one thing, it'll all work out. It just doesn't. And, and knowing that, I put that together. And so I do consulting with companies anywhere from the tech space, Web3, blockchain, um, down to the one right now who's transacting, you know, uh, using transactions in gold through digital payments. I mean, I just really enjoy lots of different things. And what I found over the course of time is uh, I really specialize in lead gen and it's because it's getting people's attention and you do that with copy and content and gosh, you know, what more perfect medium than there is than cold email. How do you randomly get someone's attention and do it at scale? And I, I've always found that to be absolutely fascinating and I still love it and still do it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. That's why I introduced you as a, as a master of, of cold email um, really one of those uh, guys that uh, has, has mastered the game. But what would you say are some of the crazy results you've gotten with, with cold outreach or cold email? Uh, maybe an anecdote. Okay. So uh, obviously uh, when you guys got started, I was uh, the one came barking out the gate and everybody on this podcast needs to know these guys literally are the best. So um, we interviewed tons of companies. And the reason why I went here is I had about 10,000 like Gmails like burned in like a month. Okay. So using the old systems doesn't work. So domain-based sending or, you know, using actual real stuff works way better. And so once I switched over, I got to see what the actual results were and let's go down the list. Uh, we've had, I've had one client for investing. So they're reaching out for, to do a $25 million raise and they through cold email have gotten over four to five, probably close to 500 people say, send me your pitch deck. Now, just think about how crazy that is. In this world, people would pay anything to get in front of an investor, just to have a conversation. And that's just on autopilot. We've had, I've had companies that have 10X, 20X revenues from organic outreach, just by having the right copy and content in place with the good targeting and data to make sure it actually lands. And then a system in place to follow up. Uh, We've done this now for what 20 30 clients uh just for an investing space crazy results of people just going yeah i'd like to talk because you never know until you you know reach out to somebody mm -hmm. and then you just do it appropriately from a real person and bada bing bada boom hey you're on a call and i think that's what the great part about email is is that it gives you the chance to keep testing audiences and do it at enough scale so then you can determine is does your offer make sense because now i you know, and those, I'll take the flip side, ready? I've seen the ones that have all just failed. And then you can look at it and go, you know, he's just not that into you. It's, it's your offer. Your offer isn't good. Your website, when they go to it, isn't registering. They're going, this doesn't make sense because a confused mind does not buy. And to me, anything that's cold and outreach, if you can get that, it means you have something dialed in. It means it's just you can go up to any individual that is in your target audience and they're going to say, yeah, I want to talk about this. And that's what I've always loved about it is that chance to test back and forth. And there is to this day, there's still nothing better. Cold email, LinkedIn and other things, they limit how much you can do. Facebook, there's too many guardrails on it and you got to do paid advertising. 
But man, if you got the right data and you got a good message and they can look you up and find you, uh, I don't know if there's any more cost effective way of doing business. <laughs> okay, great. Yeah. What would you say are some of the fundamentals of cold email that the, the core pillars to get results? Core pillars. Uh, it always starts with the data. It is if you can write the best thing on the planet, if it doesn't land in the inbox, you're screwed. Okay. And what you guys do it instantly is you've built a really good system that allows the mechanics to make sure that with the active warm up going back and forth, that it has a chance to hit. So that's, that's a mechanical part you've taken care of. So that's for me, for me, it's great. Cause I, I kicked that out of my brain. I'm like, okay, I don't have to worry about that. So what am I worried about? I'm worried about the data. I'm worried about, Hey, when you're doing first name, last name or company name or anything, is it spelled right? Are there people who put little ampersands and dashes and commas in there? Because grammatical errors go to spam or people look at it as being unprofessional. The second thing, once you get past the data component of it, is you have to really look at that subject line. What is true? It's not baiting and switching. It's not just, you know, just saying, hey, free, free, free. What, what can you do to get someone's attention? Are you asking a question? Are you making a statement? Because the subject line that determines open rates. That's it. If you get the right target and you have the right subject line, it's open rate. And so if those are high, well, it comes down to then the offer, which is the copy. How can you communicate in less than, I do this with investors. So this, I've gotten this down to a science. Ideally, it needs to be read in 35 seconds. If it takes more than 45 seconds, generally speaking, they're not going to read it. And I know that's like crazy. Like, sit there, do I sit there and time it? Yeah, I've started comparing it from campaign to campaign. And that one extra sentence, all of a sudden, you start seeing decreases in response. You need to be to the point. You need to be clear about your offer. And then you need to say, is this, would you be interested in a call? Would you be interested in learning more? Would you, what, you know, what, what other information could we provide? You have to, answer, have, to ask, have to ask a question. Because if you don't ask a question, why is everyone going to respond? And it just has to look professional. And I really make sure to the point where I use a lot of like domains. So that way we point back to the main website. And then if someone were to go and copy and paste and go click it in there, because let's just be honest, I don't use any links. I don't put any links in there because that's a track back and that tends to get your stuff, you know, sent to spam eventually. But one of the real key components of all of it is to make sure that they can find you. Because just think about it. We, we always look at like from our angle, like our perspective, like I'm sending this out and everyone's going to love what I do. Well, that's not true, right? Now let's look at it from their angle. They get a lot of these every day. Like in just the capital raising investor space, I had one investor tell me I can get upwards of 40 pitch decks a day. 40. Let's think about that. 40 pitch decks. What is it going to do to make you to rise to the top? You have to be clear, concise to the point and they don't want a lot of fluff. And if you do all those things, you tend to get much better responses than doing the things that are just trying to like kind of egg them in. And, and instead, can they find your website? Because I do this all the time. For every copy we have at the bottom, we have the company name and I'll even spin tax the company name a bit. So that way there's some little variations that go out. So that just kind of cycles it through instead of one thing. But just, just think about this. They go and copy and paste it, stick it into Google and say, what is this company? And if they can find you, cool. Guess what if they can't find you? You don't have a cold email problem. You've got an SEO problem. Mm -hmm. And so you have to think through not just what your intent is. You have to think about the journey of somebody learning about you. And do you look credible? Can they find you on LinkedIn? Can they find you on Facebook? Can they find articles you've written or positive things about you? And if they can't do it, in seven seconds, you're done. They're going to copy, paste. You have seven seconds as they're scrolling around to get their attention. If not, they're going to move on. And every, if, if you're in the game to do this, and you, particularly if you do it at scale, you have to think, how can you replicate this? How can you measure it? How can you validate everything that you do to be able to generate the results that you're looking for? And can you be found? And I think that's, that's, that's a really key component as you start looking at how you go and build cold email. Okay, gotcha. And let's say you're starting off with a brand new offer, like a new offer. How do you quickly find a winning campaign and how do you scale it from there once you find the winning campaign? Split test the daylights out of it. 
So everyone, um, I, I, I teach people how to write content and I, I do it in this way. Okay. So, uh, maybe I have videos on it and they can show people, but here's how it works. First, you have to come up with whatever your intent is. Like you're coming up with, you have an offer and you're going to go put it out there. And then what I like to do is you go sit there and go, okay, think about it. You have to set a time to actually write. Okay. You, you do, because we have to batch it. Um, you have to batch all the things that you're going to put together. Otherwise, this takes too much time. You're going to sit there all day thinking about it. You can't do that. Ideas are worthless. Execution is everything. So knowing that, here's what you do. You first come up with it and you're like, okay, I, I want to come up with, say, three different offers to these different audiences. And then what I do is then I go and I exercise. Okay. I go for a run. I go lift weights, whatever. And while I'm doing that, I come up with subject lines. And the reason I come up with subject lines is because subject lines is thinking, my brain's now pumping, you know, some more O2 and it's just feeling good, right? Then I will go and just, I'll be on my running. I'll do this. I'm serious. I'll grab my phone like this and I'll just start doing voice notes while I'm running. And I know this seems crazy, but just bear with me. And then when I get back, I then just sit down and I just start writing. And I just crank it out. And I've just done this so many times because then in a matter of, I've done this before for companies, I've written upwards of 10 emails professional emails in 30 minutes. I even recorded myself doing it just to prove that this can be done. Mm -hmm. And with that, then I just go, I, I dump it in there and then I don't look at it till the next day. And then I go back with my editing brain and I go piece everything together. And I'm writing it for different offers, different subjects, like different audiences. And I'm just thinking through structure because we get too caught up in like the tiny little detail words. You have to look at the overall impression of what you've sent out. And then you can't do that with your creative mind and your editing mind cannot exist in the same plane. They, they, they're combative. It's just different parts of your head. And so that's what I do to go write copy. And then I will go test three different audiences with three different uh, copies. And then I will even split test. I'll do upwards of nine. And so I will do a different offer or copy for each audience and I'll split test it all over through. And instantly it's easy. You can just go and, Create your campaigns, load them up, ding, 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 right? Mm -hmm. Start sending. And then who you look at it and go, okay, who wins? And then whoever's responding, and this is this is always the key. Sometimes you get people, and we all know this, it's you get like really good responses, but then they don't book calls. Or you get ones that book calls, but they're the wrong audience. And then other ones, you'll you'll have campaigns, you go, you know, we only got five responses, but three of them closed. Well, there's your answer. It's like, which one ended with money? <laughs> and if you have a good sales system in place, this type of thing works amazing because then just gives you a chance to test, 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 test. There are obviously certain audiences that don't respond well to cold email. And you just have to recognize that there's certain ones that are much better for LinkedIn. There are other ones that are much better for Facebook and Google. Other ones, you just got to be dropping YouTube like, you know, ads or you got to be dropping TikTok ads. And it's just you have to figure out what works with that audience. Does someone actually respond to email in that in that fashion? And you put all those things together. And then what you got is a pretty effective campaign that you just look at now. My favorite thing, you just look at the data. You just go the data drives decisions. That's it. And if you put good copy and good data or good uh like uh, you know emails and everything in and you did your targeting and everything what comes out is going to be you do your new truth you had a truth in your mind when you started like you know, all the fish are going to jump in the boat and this is my audience why would you only be testing one particularly with a new offer when we'd ever bring on clients we'd always ask the first thing do you already have a proven offer because if they didn't to me to bring them on as a client is actually risky because you said, okay, well, you say, oh, we've had success through Facebook ads. I'm like, okay, cool. So your offer and your sales process is not the problem. There's no problem there. You just need more leads. I think commonly a lot of entrepreneurs get caught up in with, oh, it's just because I'm not getting enough leads. And then I push back. Are you closing? Like the leads you do get, are you closing? And then they're like, oh, well, no, it's just because I need more. Well, no, you have a sales problem. You have a communication problem. You have a, a process problem. And no amount of email is going to fix that. And I will tell this to the date. There is my one record. And then everybody knows this. Like I had to count it. 
we sent 126 positive replies to a client and they closed zero deals. And that's not a lead problem. That's not, and they care about, oh, the leads are bad. I go, no, we got a sales problem. And I actually hopped on a call with that client and I just put my head down and went, you, you, you have a fundamentally bigger issue, which is why the companies that today I work with in the consulting, I go and before we even start, I go, if you have an operational issue, I won't work with you. And it's because I was like, I, if I do, I'm taking over your company. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go rip everything apart. If you have a sales to lead gen issue, I step in. Because so I go, okay, I can help with that. I can help here. But if I have to go fix the operations, we got a bigger problem. And I, I like people to even look at that when you're looking at your cold email. You need to look at it as that's one means. It's a tip of the spear. That is one thing to look at. But if you go and say, if this doesn't work, nothing's going to work. You have obtuse thinking. You are too stuck in this mindset of if they just, if they, if they see me, everyone's going to love it. That doesn't work that way. You have to think through all parts of your business. And if you do that, man, you have a heck of a lot of success. And those people out there who are crushing it, I can tell you when we'd work with them, they crushed it even more. It's because if you already have success, success begets more success. And that's why I say focus on getting, that's why I call it, I stay ready, get ready like one time. Okay, and then stay there and just keep building on it. So yeah. this cold email is a phenomenal way to be able to do that. Yeah, yeah, get ready and stay ready for sure. And uh, <laughs> just circling back real quick on the thing you said with the, with the split test, right? You load up the campaign, you create three variations or how many, however many variations, like you, you send out the campaign. When do you decide which one of these different variations, A, B, Z, D, whatever, is the winner. Like how much volume do you send out before making that decision? One to 2000 emails. Okay. That's, that's like, if I had to go to my, my go-to number, it'd be about one to 2000. Okay. Um, a lot of people like to wait around and then they say, Oh, well, I'll go to 5,000 and 10,000. Um, I, again, I, 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 I always like to take everything in the entrepreneur world and just make a, sometimes a joke about it, but it, it, they're just not that into you. If you're not getting it at that, you have, you have to recognize, you go back through the data. And actually, that's probably, that's a probably a good thing to bring up. It's like, okay, how do you make a decision? Which is, which is great. Okay. Here's how I go and make decisions. The first of which is I go and me personally, I generally turn off open rates after I start sending because I want to send. And if I see they're opening, I know it's working. I generally turn it off. Okay. Because I, I, I'm going by replies at that point. I don't really care if people open things. Open means, opens, remember, order open means the subject line is good and the audience you're going after is target because they identify with the subject line okay if your subject line is fine and your open rates are good now let's go look at your replies so if your replies are doing really well and they're all saying no over and over well generally what that means is you've probably identified the right audience but your offer is probably off because they're looking at it and going well no but I had enough to reply and say, no, I'm not interested. If it's the audience is completely off, they generally won't say anything. You just get a bunch of stops and leave me alone, that kind of thing. So then you're, you're definitely off. If you are getting great replies and a lot of positive ones coming through, but then you're not getting book calls, it means because you have a follow-up problem. Like you're not, like you thought like they're sold? No, they just said, yes, I'm interested. I mean, that's not exactly sold. <laughs> we live in a TikTok 15 second world, everybody. We want the dopamine hits all day long, right? So um, with, with them, when it, come, when it comes to that evaluation process, I just keep going down the row and go, okay, I've sent out 2000 emails. I know I have a great open rate. If I don't have a great open rate, it means the subject line is off, make the change then continue and test again. If the open rate is perfectly fine, reply rate is really low I'm, or all negative, I'm like, I have an offer problem. So then I'm gonna go in and change the offer. If I'm getting tons of bounces and issues like that, it means I didn't clean the data correctly. And so I could just be not hitting the inbox at all, not because of a subject line, but because of a mechanical issue. Hmm. And if you, it, it sounds like a lot, but it's actually not. 
because you can just step back and just look at it at face value and go, I did this, did it result in book calls? Okay, or sold items, whatever. Okay, generally I go by book calls just because that's that gets us to the sales part of it. So we have lead gen, then you have setting, then you have sales, then you have closing, then you have handoff operational, then you actually go into operations and success, all that kind of stuff. So if that lead gen and setting component is really important, let's make sure we focus on that. And that's all we're really going to be talking about. And then you can really make determinations on what you need to change. Just let the data make the decision. That's it. Yeah. Okay. Um, going back to this point where you said, right, just them saying that they're interested is not enough. You need to follow up as well. Like, what is your process to turn a positive reply, a positive lead into actually a booked call? So the fir first of which is, um, I will actually go and send out calendars, you know, probably like most people as far as a reply. Uh, then within instantly, I make a rebound campaign. So what to do is I drop them into, once it's positive, I drag them over into another campaign and that one just keeps following up with them. Uh, and, and then I only will, from that one, I only use, ideally, I'll only use one, uh, one email. So that way there's consistency. When we reply back the first time, you do it manually. I'll kick the thing into GHL also to be able to record, you know, make sure we have information because that's important, have go I level or any sort of CRM so you have it. And then what we do is we always CC in that main email. So the reason I CC it in is because you say, hey, this is like, this is the one I book with. Okay, it's very, it's, it's not uncommon. I've never had anybody push back at it. And the reason you put that there is that CC is so that when they get follow-ups from the other email, that it's going to be consistent. Otherwise, obviously with instantly, it's randomizing the, which email it's coming out from. And so you have to, you have to counter for that. And in doing this, then it's not, you set it and forget it. I'll even then go onto people's LinkedIn's and I'll go find them there or I'll go onto their website and type them a message there. If they haven't responded within two business days, just start blasting them. And people think like, oh, this is rude or this is being aggressive. They said yes, but now stop looking at yourself. Look at the person on the other end. Think like turn around like this and see what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. They're maybe just busy. We get busy. Maybe the emails are getting dumped in with a hundred other ones that hit at the same time from other people marketing stuff. So give people the benefit of the doubt. In my world, until they say no, it's still a possibility. So when they say yes, you got to, everyone thinks, okay, they're, they're, they're jumping in. They are absolutely not. They have just indicated interest. They do, they get this with, let's make it analogous to like Facebook. So I do healthcare consulting with uh, chiropractic and PT clinics. And they think once somebody fills out a form and they say they, or even book an appointment, this is probably good for literally any audience that is listening to this right now. I work with them to then say, okay, so they said yes. And now you need to get them to show up because that's what a booked appointment or a book call is. Book call is booking it, then showing up. Okay. The reason people don't show up is because somewhere between them seeing something, they were got energy and emotion to make an action. That's what they did. Cool. Between that and any other time until they actually show up to a call, energy decreases. What are you going to do to keep increasing the energy to validate the reason why they booked in the first place or they expressed interest in the first place? This is assuming the sale even before you have gotten somebody on a call or just to continue talking. And I think this is the mistake that is made more often in marketing than anything else is they're like, oh, I got a whole bunch of leads. Well, that's a bunch of crap. That's great. So what are you going to do with those leads? And they go, oh, well, they're going to book. Okay, now you're arrogant. Like this is ego. This is your ego going, I am the best. Don't tell people you're the best. Show people you're the best. Make content and send it over them that makes sense. Show people your social traction. Send people VSLs that explain who you are and what you do. Make content, drop it out on social media, show that you're a professional and you're providing value out there. And guess what? Leads will start converting even on their own. The reason people, they say yes, because they liked you, but what if they can't find you? 
What if they go and look up stuff about you and there's like 10,000 negative Google reviews? I've had this with clinics. I can't make this up. We get people like 20 people would book for patients and nobody would show up. And then you go to their page and find out they had like 20 negative or one star reviews on Google. Well, you better go fix that issue because everyone is seeing this nonstop. And that's, and that's where you can use it. And then instantly you can do that, just kind of automate it to a bit, like just to, okay, because you have, you can't have this top of mind all the time, but unless you are, and clearly you're doing millions of dollars a year, you can just ignore what the heck I have to say. Okay. But if you're not, every lead that comes in, you need to be on it. You need to be finding every single way to get them on a call. And if you're not doing that, what are you doing? Do you have a business or do you have a hobby? <laughs> like, like, I hope you have a business. You spent all this time and effort and money, but it seems like a hobby because hobbies you go in and out of. Business, you're on it to win and to have success. And success is always simple, is the crossroads of time, money, and freedom. That is what success is, okay? Some of the word between those three things. And if you do all those things right, you, you, you're going to have more of it because after working with over, I must be up to 1200 companies at this point. I can tell you this right now, the top 10%, you might want to pay attention to what they do. There's a reason why they're better. They're not smarter and they're not harder working necessarily. Yeah. If you want to be a billionaire, you probably got to work a hundred, 120 hours a week. I get it. But the ones who are making millions, they just, they just get it. They treat customers well and they never assume the sale. They just make sure they're always on top of it to get them on a call. And then whoever it is and what you do is going to come out and shine. Yeah. Dude, I, I love that. Like, do you have a hobby or do you have a business? Like, it's so true. Even like a positive uh, lead comes in, an interested reply comes in. It's not just enough to reply to them. You have to like f keep following up, stay, stay top of mind, make sure your website is on point, your SEO is on point. Uh, keep providing value until they actually, you know, book, book that call, even after the book. Treat, like, treat it like a relationship. All right. I, I know we always do everything in business. Okay. You want to go date this girl. And all of a sudden she says, yeah, I'm interested in going out. What do you, do you just sit there and put the phone down? Like, is that what you do? Like, Oh, I'm in. Woo. And you <laughs> run off. What is this? Yeah. Like you, you might want to say something back and then, I don't know. Then there, she might be like, I don't know. I heard something about, no, no, I'm talking with you. Let me tell you how great I am. I'm giving you my, my awesome stats. Okay. And then, you just, then what's your date? The date's like the book call. You show up and you're like, Hey, how, how, uh, I I'm validating what everything I saw via text and other people. And that's what we're doing on this date. Every, that is what sales is. It's a dating process and you're not going to dress up and put on some effort to get somebody in. You can automate a lot of things. It's true. But if you're not willing to put that effort in, yikes. <laughs> it doesn't just, we get caught up on business. It's all of life. And so follow up because people mm. care. People follow up because that's action. Action defines things. Problem is we get distracted all the time. That is our issue. We get distracted. Like this is more important. I'm more worried about watching someone else's YouTube about how they've made millions of dollars instead of focusing on how I'm going to make millions of dollars. Screw them. Even they're like, I'm giving you the information so you can go make millions, but you keep looking at me. It's which great for my social media, but awesome. But instead you're more worried about what you're not instead of focusing on what you are. Yeah. Yeah. No, 100%. Okay, Keith, like quick intermission. It's a cold emails and hot takes tradition. We do some rapid fire cold email related questions. Sweet. Okay. Are you, are you, are you ready for a couple of rapid fire questions? Yeah. And I obviously hopefully rapid fire them back. So this will be fun. Okay. Okay, great. So first one, what are your favorite B2B data sources? Uh, B2B data sources, I get them from Seamless, actually pulling directly from LinkedIn. Uh, I actually like any databases that I can pull on my own and call and organize. Uh, I don't like buying lists and I don't like going to anyone else that says my data is valid. You, there's a bunch of garbage. There's a bunch of bombs in there and it destroys domains. No. Yeah. Okay. What are some of your favorite subject lines? Favorite subject lines, anything that has their first name and either one asks a question or two makes a statement. So for instance, if it was an investor, I'd be saying something like, John, interested in investing in the future of blockchain, question mark. If it was more of a statement, it would be something along the lines of, 
uh, build it, and I'll just go with like, say a, a B2B and say the uh, going out salespeople. It's like, clo close your next 15 sales today, Keith. Okay. Gotcha. And then in doing that, what it does is allows us to spin tax things out. It keeps it nice and fresh. And it's a direct statement to the individual. Mm -hmm. Okay. What, what is your favorite call to action in a cold email? Ah, okay. Always depends on the audience. Obviously, if it's an investor, uh, would you be interested in seeing a pitch deck? If it is somebody who you are doing a direct B2B offer to, I always ask if you're interested in scheduling a call to learn more. If it is an informational one, it would be, would you like you're just trying to engage and just to find interest in what you're doing, perhaps you're trying to make an offer. I would send out, would it be okay to send additional information? Then otherwise it'd be, or also, would you be interested in joining our group? All these cases, it's a question. All these are call to actions. It's just really depending on where you want them to go next. Okay. What's your favorite follow-up messaging? Ah, favorite follow-up. Okay. So um, if I get somebody, it depends the the volume and it depends on the audience. So for instance, if it is in say the investor space, I'm gonna spend a little bit extra time because I'm gonna go probably look at who they are and maybe look up a few pieces of information and then follow up with those few pieces of information. The more valuable the, the deal or opportunity, the more you need to spend some more time to be able to garner more information to put into the follow-up. If you're selling something that's like, 50 bucks a month, hundred bucks a month, $500 a month. You just need to do, and it's just call to action and just drive them through because volume wise, it's not worth the time and effort, but you start having deals and things that are worth say 10,000 a month, or you're doing a raise and it's for $5 million. Guess what? I probably take the extra five minutes, show up and try to look up a little bit of information to follow up with them. That makes that Remember, we talked about it's, it's like, they get tons of stuff every day. It doesn't matter who you are. What gets you to rise to the top of the stack? And that's what I like to do. I generally like to make sure I'll look up just a little bit. Even just one piece of information makes a tremendous difference. Look up their website. There's lots of things you can do. Okay, great. Yeah, thanks for sharing all that cold email info. As a, as a last part in the podcast, I really love to learn more about your mindset as an entrepreneur. You have a lot of experience. Like, what's your mindset? How do you achieve success? How do you go about it? How do you think about it? All right. That's probably, it's a whole reason why, uh, even the mindset thing, that's why I built, I stay ready. I, I literally did that because it is a, it is a collection of everything I've done right. And more importantly, everything I've done wrong. And so mindset I find comes from what's important to you. And then I know most people's gut reaction is to say, well, I want to build a, a company that does $10 million of revenue a year. I was like, I, I got that. I got that. Um, but that's not what I asked. That's what's important in business. Like, what's important to you? Like, what do you value? And when you have a mindset, it needs to revolve around that. Like what's going to get up and drive. And it's because it's not always business because you're going to have wins and losses. And if everything relies on that, you are going to be an emotional roller coaster. And the most successful individuals in any space are emotionally controlled. They're focused. They know what's important to them. And then they go after it. And so from my end, that's why you said ready, which just stands for reality, your entourage, reality. Like, what are you baked into? Like, what's your reality? Then your entourage. Okay. Who are the people that are most important with you? Start there. And then you determine your actions. Like, what am I going to do to be successful? Here's the actions I do every day. Then you have distractions in your life. You do. You got to get rid of them. You have to limit them. You have to find ways to remove them. And your distractions could be your own ego. It could be yourself. Because all that then comes down to why. Like, why do you do what you do? So I always tell people is this. If, if you have a mindset, if you want the simplest way to do this. When you have the time with who you want to be with, where you want to be and doing what you want to do, that becomes kind of like your why. And if you do that, we try to always build a why around other people and what they believe and what's important to them. But that's just like the same crap where it's like, I, I am what I think you think I am, right? I, I'm, my interpretation of myself is what I believe your belief of me is. 
And if you want to do mindset to be successful as an entrepreneur, you have to believe in yourself. Like you have to, that has to be where it starts. You have to get rid of all the other crap and all the other social media and all the other things telling you you're not good enough. You're not smart enough. If you, you need to go buy my program for this or my thing for that, because if you don't, you won't be successful. And I'm going to go pop champagne and sit on Lamborghinis and I'm going to go do all these types of things that are going to goad you into making you feel less. You think you're getting on there because you want more? No, it's because now you feel less. I have had that in my own life and I've done made big mistakes because I was so concerned about what other people thought of me instead of saying what's valuable to me. And in mine, my family and coming out here and living the life that I want to is more important than trying to grow a company to make millions overnight. And so, because then I accept that what I do will be slower and more incremental. And I accept that. I think too many people don't. So what they do is they, in their heart, they believe that, but they act other things. And guess what happens? The things that are important fall apart. And that's their foundation. That's the root. That's the thing that, that has actually kept them going, the energy. I would say you're any founder, any entrepreneur, you are two things. You are a foundation, a structure, and you're a battery. You're literally, it's, it's the matrix, everybody. Blue pill, red pill, doesn't matter. You are a battery. Okay. And you energize this business and you create the structure and everything goes around you. We think of it like a pyramid. We think mindset and everything else. I sit on top and everything's below me. When you start out, you are on the bottom and the weight of everything is crushing down on you. So you better get your life right. And that will help your mindset. And when your mindset is better, then what happens is you start making better decisions. And when you make good decisions, good decisions lead to more good decisions. And then you aren't distracted. And then you're focused. And then you're not worrying about what everyone else is doing. And then when it comes to somebody sending an email and going back and there's a lead, you know what to do next. You're going to follow up. You're going to put the time and attention in. You're not assuming anything. You're, you think, oh, well, these other people do it this way. Well, they didn't start out that way, everyone. They ground it to start. And then they built systems and built things on top of it and kept their life in check the whole way through. And when they did that, sort of success. And then you look to them for guidance. So if you want mindset, if you want to get controlled, you got to stay ready. You get ready like one time and then figure out how to stay there. And I think the biggest mistake we do make is we get caught in the idea stage and Nils, I'm, I'm also a victim to it. You've probably been there too, right? You're not sure you have this idea, and this idea, this, right? And you're Love popping it. around, right? Ideas are the death of entrepreneurs. They are the death, but they're also our life. Isn't that crazy? It's a double-edged sword. It sits mm -hmm. right in the middle. It sucks. Absolutely mm -hmm. sucks. So you have to figure out how do you go from idea, then you strategize it, then you test it, then you analyze it, then you execute it. And at some point you have some things in the idea stage, some things in the strategy stage, some things that are testing, some things that are analyzing and some things that you're executing on. But too often we're trying to do either all at once or we're just stuck in that idea phase because it's a buffet. And that's the mindset of an entrepreneur. It's like, I'm an ideas guy. No one cares about ideas guys, everybody. They care about executors. Nobody cares. It's execution. You can have all the great ideas. I don't care. If you only had ever one good idea, but you executed on that idea, you are better than the person who has a thousand ideas. No, it's true. Mm -hmm. Mindset, get your stuff together, get ready, figure out what's important, put boundaries up in your life to make sure things work on both sides. And then you freaking go after it and you stop worrying about what everyone else is saying. You start focusing on what your value, what your value is, who you are, what you do and why you're amazing. And then you become, I call it, you're, you're, you're the shit. You're successful. You're happy. You're influential and you're talented. That's what we all want to be. So go be it and stop worrying about what everyone else has to say. No, yeah, Awesome. Awesome. You, you mentioned that distractions part, like distraction can also be ego. What is, what is ego exactly? And how do you see it uh, trip up entrepreneurs along the way? Uh, okay. So in sales, there are seven benefits. Okay. We all can argue and get into details of it, but I've broken it down to seven. Okay. It's either make money, save money, save time, decrease a headache, increase marketability, stroke an ego. <laughs> we're here. And then finally 
do right by people, which by the way, do right by people, either help them, entertain them, make something better in their life, that type of thing. Um, literally going to a movie is doing right by people because you're just entertaining. Them. Okay. Mm -hmm. Ego is necessary. It is. It absolutely is necessary. It's when our ego falls into two directions. It either becomes unchecked into narcissism or it becomes unchecked into being battered by others. Okay. So I'll give you examples. A healthy ego means you're going out there and you are confident in yourself and who you are and what you have and you're, you're great to go. Unhealthy ego is assuming the sale before it's happened because that's not execution. That's just you walking in there. And that's not confidence. That's a completely different. Confidence is going, I got this. Confidence is you keep following up with that lead and get them on a call. Confidence is once they're on the call, you just actually keep executing. Ego is you're that unchecked and crappy ego is you're going and going, oh, well, they're just going to, well, they weren't good enough anyway. If they didn't want to talk with me, I mean, of course, everybody wants to talk with me. If they did, they would be doing it. You probably see some of the best people out there in marketing and you're like, why are a lot of people so attracted to them? There's a reason. They know how to control and, and you may say, oh, they're an uncontrolled egomaniac. No, they're controlled. They know exactly what to say, when to say it, how to say it, how to engage and to make sure that at the end of it, you push towards execution. They're not distracted at all. Like I go into sales calls and I have a game plan every single time and I'll pivot it right, left or center. I'm controlling what's going on. So I'm controlling myself. If I spent the whole time and you came to a call to help your business and what if I talked about myself the entire time? Uh, yeah. Sorry, audience. Yeah. There's a ton of you out there who do it. I, and you know why you're doing it? is for the second part of ego. You're trying to talk yourself up because you're not confident. Like somebody booked a call with you, no different than a date. The girl showed up to the date, showed up, right? So wh why are you sitting there and spending all your time talking about yourself instead of learning more about them? You know who you are and what you do. In this case, you don't. That's why this happens. This is what unchecked bad ego is, is you aren't, you, you are trying to be overconfident at something instead of just going, here's my plan and here's who I am and sticking with it. And I see this so often from too many entrepreneurs and they're the ones, by the way, who say, ready? Oh, I'm really good at building things. I'm just bad at sales. Mm -hmm. You know why you're bad at sales? Because you have deflated ego. That's why. And yeah. those are the ones that will go out and talk about all the successes they've had. They constantly uh, blow up things that aren't really a big deal. That's because you're trying to compensate for the fact that you haven't been successful and you're trying to talk to the world like you are, but you haven't delivered the goods. You haven't executed. You are just yip-yapping. So yeah. ego is necessary <laughs> like no 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 one wants the sad sack but they also don't want the person who's just all about themselves you go into a call it's about you and the customer so if, when it comes to ego it's something that you have to learn how to control and if you do those who have been the most successful in all the business learn how to control it the best and execute and they are not distracted i promise you all their actions are in one direction success yeah Awesome. You're beautiful. And that, I mean, that was uh, amazing, amazing uh, knowledge. Keith, man, thanks for, for being on the podcast, you know, being on, being on the show on the episode today and uh, learned a lot from you. I'm sure like the viewers listening learned a lot um, from this episode and for people who want to learn more or connect with you, where should they go? Um, probably the best place to go would be just the website. Um, it's www.istayready.com and spell it I S T A E R E A D Y. Uh, because, uh, you know, the, probably the other one was already taken and I just always fit with my scheme. So that's I stay ready.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. Um, I'm under KJ Cronin and you can reach out to me there, but, um, we're going to be, I'm going to be putting out a lot more social media, just content, things like this. 
that are going to be going on YouTube and Instagram and um, TikTok. So you can also go check it out there. That, that's that, it just started. So this is not like something that's built up. You can see like my 72 followers or something on Instagram. Well, I just been the 41 year old guy in the background of uh, like hundreds of businesses. And I'm just finally now stepping out and going, OK, I guess I got something to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, awesome. Yeah, and I'll add these, these links in the description, the website, your LinkedIn, also your YouTube channel. I was watching your YouTube channel, some really good stuff on, on there, and I recommend everybody. Two videos, to everybody. Got yes. two. There'll be about 15 more coming in the next few days. Yeah, yeah good stuff. All right. Yeah, Keith, again, thanks for your time, and um, I will talk to you soon. I appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye.